What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another interview edition of Learn Crypto. My name is Nick Hellman. I'm, I'm the sorry. president of WyckoffSMI.com, Todd Butterfield, and then the co-founder of Fundstrat Global, Thomas Lee. How are you doing today, Mr. Lee? Good. Thanks. Now, before we get started, make sure to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And if you want to see more interviews, reviews, and crypto technical analysis, hit the little notification bell. I guess to start, if you just want to give a background on what Fundstrat Global really is. Um... You know, we've been in business for four years. Uh, I founded it after leaving J.P. Morgan and was their chief equity strategist. And I'd been at J.P. Morgan since 1999, so you know, uh, well over 15 years. Our business today, and it's it's growing and it's evolving, but at the but today as it stands, it's uh, it's a research service geared almost solely to uh, institutional investors, so hedge funds, mutual funds. Uh, some family offices and private banks, and we comment on traditional markets, so equity, which is sort of my domain. We have a technician named Rob Slimer who came from RBC. Uh, we talk about quant strategies, which is run by Sam Doctor, who came over with me from J.P. Morgan, and we have a policy arm uh, led by Tom Block, who ran government relations for J.P. Morgan, uh, for over 25 years. So, you know, a lot of JP Morgan folks, uh, here. And, uh, but as, as we, th we do thematic work and one of the thematic areas we've spent a lot of time in is digital assets and crypto. Um, so, you know, over the past two years, we've started to sort of provide a, a more robust suite of services around that, but you know, who knows what we look like in five years, right? Of course. Right. Be different. We could be writing this research for Mars. Um, you know, I've heard you talking a lot about the fair value of Bitcoin, talking about digital assets. Bitcoin is really the index for the whole digital asset ecosystem. Uh, where are we in that value cycle and what metrics do, do you really use for that fair value analysis? Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, one of the challenges for Bitcoin is because by nature, it's not centralized, right? It's a decentralized blockchain um, and, uh, it, it's difficult for people to sort of think that there's a way to value, uh, the business, but I mean, to value the blockchain itself, but for, for Bitcoin, we found that some sort of historical analogs work fairly well for crypto. Um, in Bitcoin's case, you know, I think the two that we tend to rely the most on is one is, is essentially a measure of usefulness, which is network addresses plus transaction activity. So if you just did a two variable model, those two variables have explained over 90% of Bitcoin's price moves since 2013. And so it's essentially the same reason social media companies have value. It's, it's the reason Facebook has value is that its pool of users uh, creates economic value that Facebook sells advertising. In a Bitcoin's case, you know, this network value uh, actually does have value because you can pledge the assets and earn, you know, um, margin, you know, you, you do margin lending, um, or you can measure it as transaction fees. But by those two variable models, fair value for Bitcoin is around 14,000. Um, another way to value Bitcoin is to think of it as a commodity and, and then the, the price to mining, mining break evens, um, which is a combination of hash power and hardware cost and electricity. Electricity is the biggest piece. That break-even is around 5,800 for Bitcoin today. So most miners who, who have six cent electricity, six cents per kilowatt hour aren't making money on Bitcoin. Um, but in a bull market, as you, you guys would know, uh, price to break-even could be over two and a half times. And so that would imply Bitcoin should be 14,000. So 14,000 is probably fair value. And if a bull market starting, then Bitcoin has a lot of upside. Right. I guess I'm also interested in an update on your misery index. Yes. Um, if you give me a minute, I can just check the latest value, but the, the misery index is a measure of uh, the price consistency of Bitcoin. And uh, let's see if I have it here. I might actually have to ask my team to recalculate it, but um, and generally it's a buy when the number is in it. Generally when it gets to an extreme low, and the misery index is oversold, then Bitcoin's actually attractive. And at the moment, right. let's see where this is. Um, the misery index is 
you know, I'm just gonna have to, I might send a little message to my guys and ask them just to post the chart of the misery index. That works for us and then maybe we can go back to it here in a few minutes. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, another thing that I wanted to kind of talk about as we kind of wait for the misery index valuation discussion, you know, a few days ago, you're on CNBC Fast Money once again, a lot of crypto people, either they love it or hate CNBC Fast Money for what they do with cryptocurrencies. But, you know, I, I, I reminded or I remember you saying something about dry powder is evident uh, with this recent price move. Do you think that crypto enthusiasts or kind of OG crypto holders are going to be coming back to this ecosystem and continue to accumulate around these levels? Uh, that, I, I think that's exactly what's happening. Um, you know, we had a, a pretty nice price move just in the past week, right? Bitcoin really had one of those sort of 10 best days up 20%. And what's interesting is uh, a lot of folks assume this was either a fluke because it was uh, April Fool's or this was just short covering and uh, forced liquidations. But Cumberland uh, just put out a piece sort of confirming what we were gathering. Our, our, our discussions really in the past couple of weeks with a lot of the original crypto holders was a sense that they were beginning to reaccumulate. And you can see it in the, in the wallet movements of older wallets. Um, but Cumberland had a piece uh, that came out that just showed that, that all the hallmarks of accumulation are evident in the trading that took place on April 1st. So it doesn't look like a forced liquidation, which means, yes, uh, crypto holders who've liquidated from you know 18,000 to lower uh, and were waiting for Bitcoin to bottom that's their dry powder. They're starting to put that money to work. Interesting. Yeah. I agree. Oh, sorry, Todd. Uh, there's a lot more dry powder from non-crypto folks, you know, the new to crypto. That's really where the, the big wave of money could come from. I agree with that as well, Todd. I don't know if you have that chart that we've been kind of sharing and, and we kind of agree with your sentiment there with Elliott Wave and Wyckoff that uh, this is something that we think can be continuation to the, to the upside. Obviously, in the future, we'll probably have another a dramatic correction, but still on the way up, putting in a higher low. And we're kind of under the impression that that 3,000 to 3,200 level was the low of this this market cycle. And uh, there's a lot of good news, whether it's Eros X back, the Bitcoin ETF possibly in Q4. Um, I think the macro fundamentals are really building to garner more utilizations of these networks. And that network utilization usually causes price appreciation that flows to the native cryptocurrencies of any given network as well. Yeah. And sorry, Todd, I, I, I know I was, I, I was start speaking and I know you were about to say something. No, I, I was interested, you know, about the dry powder. I agree with that. I think it was some short covering, but I do agree that, you know, that's whales reaccumulating and also everyone was short at the lows. No one's talking about hodling anymore. They're trading, et cetera. So I think the traders could get left behind here if they're not careful, which just, that's what happened here uh, this week. Yeah, that's right. I, I know uh, some of the traders that I speak to in crypto say they that you know it's best to trade like water, meaning it shouldn't have a bullish or bearish bent. But you're but you're right. I think over the past you know year and a half, I think the psychology changed, right. so that they became sort of entrenched in a bearish mindset. A lot of folks, not not most, but many folks became entrenched in a bearish mindset. Right, because we do a lot of Wyckoff here. I mean, I own Wyckoff SMI, so we do a lot of studies in price and volume. And then uh, you and I both got mentioned in that CCN article about my Elliott Wave count. I do throw some Elliott Wave counts just to maybe give me a roadmap, but Elliott Wave is not really my main focus. But I think definitely helpful, uh, especially in impulse moves, like maybe we're starting here. Yes, that's right. And... Uh, um, Wow. Okay. So we just got the updated uh, BMI. And uh, let's see if I can just twist the camera. Sorry, this is not going to be easy to see. Um, it's jumped. It's, uh, I saw that. it's jumped to 87 in just the past couple of days, which means that if you, I think I've seen it in your work that you guys were thinking that there's some sort of digestion that's required now for this move. And I think that's what the BMI is saying at the moment. Right. And it would jump that much from sentiment getting bullish. I mean, can you share anything why it would jump that much? Uh, it, here? Yeah. What it really looks like to us and incidentally, so the, the lowest reading for this BMI took place, it looks like in late November. So I think that was the post 
hard fork uh, rift. I'll, I'll post this on Twitter just so people can see it. Um, Perfect. And uh, and that was actually a buy signal, but now it probably looks like uh, you know it would look more like a sell, a short term sell signal here. Right. Right. Yeah, I'd be interested to see that on your Twitter. So. Yeah, and, and also talking about the dry powder, I think a lot of people are still looking for that sub 3,000 to 2.8K uh, entry. And it'll be interesting to see if this, uh, this price accumulation here in Bitcoin can continue to really make those people have to reevaluate. Uh, and that's where we can maybe get that impulse up to around 7K. That was mentioned by, by both you guys and also in the CCN article. So we'll see yeah. what happens there moving forward. And I, I guess I'd be curious your take, but you know, one of the levels that we think uh, is important psychologically, especially to crypto, but even more non-crypto people is the 200 day, um, you know, roughly 4,600 because, you know, once Bitcoin sort of holds above that, I think outside of the crypto world, it's going to generally be viewed as like Bitcoin's bear markets over. Do you guys right. think that level's important, at least in the work you guys have? I definitely think so. I mean, I don't think we'll revisit the 42, 4,300. So I'd agree if we can have a little pullback here and hold that 4,600 that that would be a good for us to get the sentiment turned around. And we don't use moving averages all that much with the Wyckoff. You don't really use moving averages, but I think from an outside perspective, if you're saying institutions are starting to come into play or new crypto investors or speculators come in the market, I think moving averages are used more frequently in the traditional finance and they might have a better understanding of where we potentially are in the market cycle for Bitcoin and other altcoins as well. Yes, exactly. And, and, and uh, yes, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, um, institutions, you know, are obviously going to ultimately run fundamentals to make uh, a high conviction decision, but market message from either the chart or uh, the consistency or trend with it that's evident in a chart is important because it's timing for them. So if, if they believe in Bitcoin, they'll still want to enter it when they think the bear market's over, not in the middle of the bear market. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot, a lot of smart money really uh, waits on that confirmation. So if you're a speculator or a long-term believer in crypto, you do get that slight advantage of getting in early. But with that comes a higher risk profile. And uh, I think once confirmation of a bear market or whatever you want to consider it being over, uh, that's when you really get those uh, 10 days that you kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, where yeah. Bitcoin really makes its biggest gains historically 10 days out of any given year-to-date uh, timeline. That's right. Um yeah, I think that's something that's probably not as well appreciated. You know, crypto, because it's an, it's essentially an ultra volatile asset, uh, and it's uncorrelated, but it's it's ultra volatile. The the benefit of just uh, those tail moves and you know just the ten day best days of the year account for all the gains for Bitcoin. So X that Bitcoin's down twenty three percent, twenty five percent a year on average. You don't the traditional equity markets aren't even close. You know, since nineteen hundred, I think if you excluded ten best days you only see 300 basis points per year of annual return. Right. And also one other thing I've always shared our subscribers in the last three or four months was I think the US dollar is maybe rolling over, which would provide some, uh, you know, wind behind the sales on cryptos. And I think maybe you're in agreement with that. And also I think interest rates stay low, US stock market maybe continues higher, which keeps risk on for the stocks and cryptos together. And I believe late in the year, you were, uh, when we were having a sell-off into Christmas, I believe right at the lows, you also were friendly and called yeah. the low pretty well. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, because to the, <clears throat> the dollar, I think, plays a big role because, one, crypto is priced in USD. Um, and I'd agree with you. If, if, if the dollar weakens or, and doesn't appreciate at least, that's right. a big tailwind for Bitcoin and crypto. Um, and risk on definitely helps because even though crypto is uncorrelated, a lot of the leakage of fiat into crypto is going to be sort of, you know, excess cash from a risk on investor. And so if they're bullish on rising assets and they, and they're seeking volatility with, especially with the VIX being low, it's going to go into crypto. Right. And you still see fair value, I think on stocks, you're still seeing higher. I know, I think I saw an update yesterday that, you've got still much higher stocks possibly. Yeah, yes, that's right. So, um, you know, a lot of our work is uh, fundamental based. We generally have sort of cycle, uh, we use cycle parameters, just think about where we are with equities. But one of the things that 
was interesting is at the start of this year, we, we were saying that a lot of our sort of really reliable models said that this would look like 2009. Um, so we would have a 25% kind of year. Um, and that would imply 3,100. I still think that that's the right number. And we don't have an official target. Our official target is 29.25. And that 200 point difference is, is primarily because the yield curve is uh, making us, we have to understand that anomaly because it is a very anomalous curve right now. Right, understood. And then really the last question is I kind of had for you before we let you get back to your busy, uh, busy day at work. Do you focus only on Bitcoin? Or are you going to start applying more of these metrics to other altcoins and maybe really focusing to what, what uh, institutions will have access to that are on fiat gateways, maybe Litecoin, Ethereum, Ethereum, and Classic are the ones that really come to mind? Are you guys primarily focusing on Bitcoin, Bitcoin because the correlation factor is so high for all the other cryptocurrencies in the ecosystem? Um, <clears throat> yeah, and interestingly, uh, the answer... The, uh, I guess the the short answer is we yes we we will be writing about other useful uh, digital currencies and projects, um, of which by the way you know Bitcoin is clearly the most useful today because it's the most widely used. But other ones you know deserve actual uh, you know to be really more carefully modeled. We we have our technician who writes about I think the top ten tokens um, in terms of market cap, but. In a, in a way, you kind of said something that's spot on. You know, the correlation is so high that I would say that 90% of the crypto call ultimately is macro in the sense that it's really going to depend on what Bitcoin does. Um, but it's not that different from traditional markets. You know, we, you know, our, our clients are primarily long, short equity investors or traditional active equity. But I think they acknowledge that, you know, 75% of the outcome of their stock decision is macro. So policy, business cycle, influence their decision arguably more than getting the earnings estimate right. Right. Do you have any last, com last comments, Todd, for Mr. Lee? I don't think so. And do you have anything that we might have missed pertaining to Fundstrat, pertaining to the crypto ecosystem, traditional ecosystem, and maybe how they might start merging here in the future? Um, well, yes, and I think that's uh, certainly going to be the case. You know, today crypto probably is – is watched with with uh, mostly suspicion and uh, you know doubt, and I think for the most part, last year's fall in Bitcoin told people that Bitcoin was on its way to zero. Um, now I think there's a decision that has to be made. I think people could be on the wrong side of history if they decide that Bitcoin doesn't matter and they want to ignore it because the U.S. has a good financial system. You probably don't need digital currencies. It's a very different world outside the U.S. when you talk about unbanked governments that have uh, unstable currencies, unstable banking, lack of access to banking, lots of distrust to governments. That's where we're seeing massive adoption of crypto. I agree there. And that's really where you see Bitcoin and blockchain can really solve a lot of issues and create a more efficient society or a more official, glo efficient global economy, especially now more than ever with the Internet it is becoming a global economy. And that's why I believe in cryptocurrencies and why I think Bitcoin uh, has definitely a spot and maybe might be a future reserve currency or a digital gold in the future as well. Yeah, that's right. And of course it won't be so inexpensive in the future. <laughs> right. That's Great all we got today. In the interview, I believe. That's all we got today, guys. So make sure to hit that like, share, and subscribe button and stay tuned for your daily updates on cryptocurrencies right here at Learn Crypto. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.